Hello friends, <coughs> welcome back to my new video. As you know that uh, I have started a series of videos called the Glossary of Cultural Studies. Today, this is the third video in that series of videos, uh, Glossary of Cultural Studies. And uh, one of the important terms in today's video that I will be starting with is cultural intermediaries. I-N-T-E-R-M-E-D-I-A-R-I-E-S. Now, what is cultural intermediaries? This concept was introduced by the French social theorist and his name is Pierre Bourdieu. P-I-E-R-R-E, Pierre Bourdieu, B-O-U-R-D-I-E-U, Pierre de Bourdieu. He was a French uh, social theorist and in his book, the name of the book is Distinction, a Social Critique of the Judgment of Taste. I repeat, Distinction, a Social Critique of the Judgment of the Taste, which was published in 1984. In this book, Pierre Bourdieu introduced the concept of cultural intermediaries. Now, what do we mean by cultural intermediaries? The, definite, the definition is basically the concept of cultural intermediaries refers to those set of occupations and workers, uh, a set of occupations and workers who are involved in the production and circulation of symbolic goods and services in the context of an expanding cultural economy in uh, post-war western societies so in the post-war western societies cultural intermediaries refers to a group of people a group of set of workers involved in set of occupations uh, where their main objective is the production as well as cir circulation of the goods and services with a symbolic uh, connotation in the context of the ever uh, you know cultural economy especially in after uh, globalization after globalization of the economy took place, cultural intermediaries have played a very, very significant role. Cultural intermediaries, we can also say, are the taste makers. They define what counts as good taste and also they define what counts as the cool culture in today's marketplace. Working at this intersection of culture and economy, these cultural intermediaries, they perform operations and what kind of operations they perform? They perform operations in the production and the promotion of consumption, construction, constructing leg uh, legitimacy and adding value through the qualification of the goods. Now, with the advent, as I said, with the advent of globalization, these cultural intermediary groups became very, very prom prominent one of the main reason was prominent because of the changes in the production of goods and services now if you see uh, one of the features of the global economy is uh, the global economy with the advent of the global economy there was a uh, tremendous shift and what was the shift the shift was from the mass production to the modes of more flexible specific production uh, catering to a special special group uh, of people with a special taste with a special special symbolic meaning uh, that this group wanted so this cultural intermediaries they try to provide these facilities to their uh, you know distinctive groups with their distinctive taste cultural intermediaries they perform in this market in this globalized market and why do they what do they perform the they mainly bring together what do they bring together? They bring together consumption and production in new, more adjustable and intimate ways by styling and restyling of brands to meet the particular or lifestyle cho choices of targeted consumer groups. That is what each target, each group of consumers, they have their own choice, their own likings, their own dislikings. Uh, so, you know, in this globalized economy, cultural intermediaries, they cater to these specific requirements of the specific groups rather than the mass production. A very good example which I can give is, 
personal from my personal uh, perspective uh, a very good example that i can give you all and i think this will help you all understand this concept in a very simple way is suppose i like a roman dial wrist watch with a white background okay i like a roman dial wrist watch with a white background and on the other hand i also like that that roman wrist watch should not be a metal it should not have a metal band it should have a leather band okay so a roman wrist watch roman roman dial wrist watch i that is my personal liking and my personal liking is also what leather band leather uh, you know band with that watch and my third liking is if that color of that leather band is black that would be great so overall what i do is i like a roman wrist watch a roman dial wrist watch i like the background of the roman dial wrist watch to be white at the same time i want that wrist watch to have a leather what do you call band and at the same time i also like the leather band uh, to be black in color so my three categories of likings are manifested in the form, form of that roman wrist watch and there is one more fourth liking that is i like suppose uh the bollywood one of the famous bollywood actors rithik roshan now imagine a particular wrist company wrist watch company for example seco now seco wrist watch company creates an ad where it showcases a roman wrist watch roman dial wrist watch with a white uh, you know dial and having a black wrist and that seco's brand ambassador is rithik roshan so what happens is my four likings are embedded together and they are presented in the form of an advertisement so what will happen as a consumer i will be more attracted to the seco company there might be that uh, uh, you know the economy is little on the higher side i have to spend a little bit more but i am i am more attracted because that advertisement that amalgamation of my choices is presented to me in the form of that ad in the form of that representation so what do these cultural cultural intermediaries do they create such kind of ads or they create such kinds of amalgamation of branding and present it they rebrand it they represent it and what do they do they cater to specific groups specific group means what i like will be liked by a particular group it can be a group of 100 it can be a group of 1000 of course they have this market study and all and then they release this advertisement so this example of this seco watch which i gave is a very very good example of cultural intermediaries which is presented to me as a consumer and i like it so this is a, a short definition of cultural intermediary so in short what do we refer to cultural intermediaries cultural intermediaries basically are people who are working in the advertisements marketing and the management section in this globalized economy for particular company or for particular group of people so i hope you understood what is cultural uh, i i am able to put across to you uh, what is cultural intermediary in a simple language now my second uh, glossary today the second term that i will be talking about today is very pertinent term and very very uh, you all will be aware of it and that is cultural tourism what is cultural tourism now if you look into the historical background after the independence of many colonized countries for example india after the independence many colonized countries and cultures they sort various ways to preserve their traditional practices so one of the very controversial and disputed method that they adopted was the establishment of cultural tourism that is what is cultural tourism the use of culture when you use the culture as an attraction for the foreign tourists that is cultural tourism in short now such tourism has also become increasingly important part of the economy for many post colonial countries it's a source of revenue generation for example in india there are many places for example rajasthan in india where people come to witness the culture because the rajasthanis they have such a vibrant culture they have such tribes 
and they have villages model villages and foreigners it, it serves as a foreign foreign attraction which also serves an epicenter of economic generation now there lies the problem that I will discuss uh, as I proceed in this lecture and of course this use of cultural practices to attract the visitors in the part of the tourism industry is is adapted by most of the countries for example in Britain also you will see that uh, Britain uses the castles and the stately homes the big big houses states estates and all or the American West they also use the traditions called the dude ranch ranches they use these 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 are all forms of uh, you know uh, encouraging cultural tourism now but in post colonial cultures especially the problematic uh, problem the problem that is is it engages with the broader issue and what is the broader issue the broader issue is ex exoticization of such cultures you keep you present this culture as an exotic culture and this issue revolves around the control of the process now this controlling is the problem why it is the problem because if there is this this concept called control then automatically there will be a question that who controls the process and who benefits from this control these are very crucial questions now in some parts of the world for example uh, where you know these issues are related to the preservation of specific art uh, cultural tourism and in some other parts in some other parts of the world cultural tourism are related to the issues of land ownership and control I give an example for example the Kimberley region Kimberley region is a region in Western Australia the Kimberley region and there is a there is a local called Mawanjum M-O-W-N-J-U-N Mawanjum J-U-M Mawanjum community they have engaged themselves in the process of renewing a sacred uh, image called the Wanjina images which were uh, you know painted on the rock walls rock faces and what did they do they use these images to create artwork and they use this artwork to be sold uh, professionally raise money which they use for the uh, health and development of health education and uh, health facilities and the development activities of that particular region but they also see this process as one of which keeps that traditional culture alive intact and it it also helps them to maintain that culture so that that culture uh, that uh, exotic culture can be transferred handed over to the next generation now this example of this Mawanjum community is a very positive example positive light it is very clear it has very considerable potential for but at the same time when this is clear that this cultural tourism in this case of Mawanjum community is used for the positive side there is always a probability that there are further exploitation of post-colonial people on issues such as the neo-colonial agendas there, there is always so this more exploitative form of tourism uh, of this uh, new colonialism agendas which are remnants they have a long history and there is a very clear link with the process of exoticization which I had uh, spoken about in the beginning the native which underplay the display of living peoples in the colonial period now this process continues in the more frankly commercial ventures this exoticization process anywhere any part of the world you go, you go you go to Brazil you go to West Indies you go to South Africa or you come to Southeast Asia you will always in the big cities or uh, culturally active uh, places active uh, attraction attractive cities you will find mostly they will have a place that is called cultural villages so what do what, what is this cultural village they will create an image of the exotic uh, culture of a particular place of their country and they will very commercialize commercially they will try to exploit it but it so it has also been sent uh, you know uh, seen as an extended form extended form of some of the ways in which post colonial cultures they continue to be represented as discourses such as development and heritage studies so in the name of this exoticization exoticization in the name of presenting uh, you know this global uh, uh, what do you call this cultural villages there is always this colonial discourse 
and what is the discourse the discourse such as development and heritage studies so these are all post colonial cultures which continue to be represented as discourses there lies the problem and you know even projects of the unesco cultural heritage programs they are also in the you know process of exploiting the very material uh, the people seek to preserve unknowingly there is also the danger of regarding such preserved cultures as fixed and unchanging this is a very very big danger because there is always a danger of you know regarding this this exoticization of culture this nativity of culture as fixed and unchanging as why fixed and unchanging because they consider they, they they tag it as essential and authentic tradition which is rendered inflexible whereas we know that culture as an entity is very dynamic it has to be flexible with you know it has to be uh, it there has to be flexibility now there are arguments some might argue there is no doubt that some might argue that cultural tourism you know they argue that this is a case of appropriation in action this is a good example for example the case of this monjun community they use it for the development of the nevertheless what i mean to say is even the most liberal of such ventures ventures of this cultural villages or unesco heritage and all these ventures they they are potentially engaged in commodification of the culture there is the problem and even of the bodies of the colonized and this has been recognized so cultural tourism in one hand can be used in the development of a particular community or group like the mohanjom community in western australia but on the other hand it can potentially be exploited because there is this pertinent question as to there are two very very pertinent question is who controls this process of this exoticization of cultures who is controlling it and who benefits from it that is you know because when you ask who is controlling it and who is benefiting in in the name of exoticization you have this cultural villages in almost all uh, uh, big cities large cities in the world now who is controlling it if there is a owner i i can give you an example in rajasthan there are outlets cultural villages outlets in different parts of rajasthan and now they are extending it to the adjoining states also suppose uh, the village name is uh, village rajasthan so if a foreigner who does who is who who hasn't seen a uh, rajasthan village he is given that taste of exploring a rajasthan village in a big city for example jaipur where there is no scope of uh, exploring a rajasthan village but there is this cultural village concept where there is a boundary that is created and inside that they create the huts and uh, they, the huts uh, the mud and uh, mud huts and the, uh, the village activities and they have people also from villages who the models you can say as villages and they try to give you that feel of cultural heritage but the question is who controls that economy are the people who are represented in the in that culture benefited okay that is the question and second the revenue that is generated who owns the profit of that revenue so in a way these cultural villages are very very pertinent examples many of these cultural villages which are presented in large cities i gave you this example in jaipur and some other cities they are very good examples of commodification when when this exoticization takes place there is every possibility of commodification taking place because again i come back to my previous question there are two pertinent questions that is who controls the process and who benefits from this process so i hope i am able to so cultural tourism has two aspects one is the positive and one is the negative aspect there is always a scope of exploration whatever topics i speak there is always a scope 
please research on these topics the videos that i prepare are introductory videos they these videos can serve you in giving you a direction these are not the end products there is always scope please uh, explore more please research more and uh, please give your valuable suggestions i try to present through these videos very crisp form of the concepts and my intention is to make you understand uh, through very easy examples and uh, if you like my videos th this is the third video of the cultural series called the glossary of cultural studies and of course this will continue there are few more videos because there are few more important concepts that i will discuss is in my upcoming videos if you like my video it is my humble request that if possible please subscribe to my youtube channel I am very very thankful that you have watched this video of mine you have spared time thank you very much for sparing your valuable time with a hope with a fervent with a firm belief that we meet very soon in our next video this is dr shaikat banerji signing off thank you so much for watching my video